Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to yet another very timely and topical AMET webinar. On Monday uh, morning, a cell of the Iranian proxy Hezbollah crossed the border into Israel proper and exchanged gunfire with the IDF. Um, certain media outlets have also reported that they fired an anti-tank um, missile at an Israeli tank. This is in revenge for an IDF attack that occurred last week near Damascus when a Hezbollah fighter, Ali Khalal Massan, was eliminated by the IDF and Hezbollah's chief, Hassan Nasrallah, had vowed revenge. Thankfully, the IDF was successfully able to ambush Hezbollah on Monday's skirmish, but tensions remain high. Um, because the IDF was successful, Hezbollah has stated that this event had, had been, quote unquote, staged by Israel. Um, Sheikh Nasrallah has still vowed revenge for the um, elimination of their fighter in Syria. And the IDF remains in a high state of alert. Um, here to answer these questions of whether or not the tensions run the risk of escalation into a full-scale war, and how the IDF is prepared to confront Hezbollah are two of the world's most preeminent experts. Um, Brigadier General Michael Herzog, um, retired, is an international fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a senior fellow at the Jewish Policy Institute. Um, Michael has retired from active duty in the IDF in late 2010 after a very long and distinguished career. His service included heading the strategic planning division of the IDF and working with four ministers of defense as senior military aide and chief of staff. Since 1993, General Herzog has actively participated in nearly all of Israel's peace negotiations with the Palestinians, the Syrians, and the Jordanians, including its back channels. Um, and in the last round of Israel-Palestinian negotiations, um, as recently as 2013 and to, to 2014. He later published an insider's unique summary and analysis of this round. Very, very vital for another issue. Um, Dr. Seth Franzman is the Middle East Affairs Correspondent of the Jerusalem Post. He's lived in Israel since 2004, has covered the disengagement from Gaza and three Gaza wars. He is the author of After ISIS, America, Israel, and the Struggle of the Middle East, and Executive mm -hmm. Director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis. He has reported from and conducted research in Iraq, Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, and the UAE. He is a former lecturer at Al Quds University on US foreign policy, and he has a PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, so let's begin with you, Michael. Um, please, what is happening and what is the background of all of this? Uh, thank you, Sarah, please. for your introduction. And um, I'll provide both the immediate background for uh, the flare up a few days ago uh, in our border with Lebanon, but also the broader context of uh, things between Israel and Iran, Israel and Iranian proxies. So as you mentioned, the, the immediate background was the fact that the IDF uh, carried out an airstrike against an Iranian target uh, in the vicinity of the Damascus airport, uh, kind of a storage facility for weapons and ammunition. And uh, in that strike, a Hezbollah operative uh, was killed. And since uh, Nasrallah vowed last year to take revenge for the killing of any of the operative by Israel, even if it's uh, not only in Lebanon, but also in Syria or elsewhere, it was expected that they will try and uh, carry out uh, some kind of act of uh, retaliation. The IDF uh, raised its uh, alert uh, along the border, sent more troops there closed the border area and uh, was preparing for that uh, eventuality. And uh, it came uh, uh, two days ago when uh, a, a cell of uh, three to four Hezbollah armed operatives crossed the border between Lebanon and Israel in the area of Shuba, which is uh, an area where, uh, you know, territorially it's not clear uh, where exactly that area belongs. It's, uh, there is a dispute there. 
there's no border fence. They uh, infiltrated in daylight. They were spotted by observation posts of the IDF. A uh, fire was open in their direction and they just ran away. And uh, what we can learn from uh, this uh, limited incident uh, is that both sides are not interested in escalation right now. It's not good, a good time for either Israel or Hezbollah to go to war to escalate things uh, because of the corona, but because of other uh, reasons uh, as well. So on the Israeli side, on the Israeli side, interestingly, the IDF decided not uh, to kill uh, those operatives across the border, but just fire a warning shot in their direction and let them run away so as not to escalate. And also it refrained from uh, uh, showing the video footage of what happened so as to refute Hezbollah's claim that it never occurred. Uh, and that tells you something about the Israeli mindset. Uh, I mean, we will deter them, uh, we'll take the necessary action, but we have no desire in, uh, in escalating things. But on the uh, Hezbollah side as well, uh, I think you, you can tell evidently that they are not interested in uh, escalation. They chose a very limited type of action along the border. Uh, and it's not the first time we've had several incidents along that border in recent years, including last year in September, following an Israeli strike in Syria, which killed two operatives, and also another uh, operation in Beirut, which they attributed to Israel. So uh, they fired a, um, an anti-tank rocket against an Israeli medical vehicle uh, with five soldiers in it. They missed twice. Uh, but it was their way of uh, trying to do something that will respond, but uh, not go beyond what they perceived as the line beyond which things will escalate. And it's quite clear that uh, they have no desire in uh, escalating things. Uh, but it's still an open issue because they, since they claim it never happened, it means that uh, they still leave open the opportunity, the, the possibility of uh, taking uh, revenge uh, or for the killing of their operative. Now, why doesn't Hezbollah want uh, escalation? Uh, Hezbollah is uh, quite a potent uh, military force. Uh, Israeli defense establishment doesn't uh, regard Hezbollah uh, any longer as a militia or just a terror group, but as a military force. <clears throat> And they have gained a lot of military experience. They have military formations. They acted in military formations in the civil war in Syria in recent years. They interacted with other uh, militaries, uh, the Russian, the Iranian, the Syrian, even the Lebanese uh, military. They were in war, war rooms with them. They learned doctrines. Uh, they conducted the urban warfare with uh, artillery support and intelligence and, uh, and you name it. And they have an arsenal of uh, estimated by the idea of, uh, of over 130,000 uh, projectiles. That includes uh, missiles, rockets, and mortars. And uh, that's a really a formidable ans a, a arsenal that very few militaries across the globe uh, possess. At the same time, and they're also very active in southern Lebanon, very close to our border, uh, in contravention of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1701. At the same time, I think Hezbollah is experiencing an unprecedented crisis, uh, the t tremendous pressures that they have not experienced in the past. To begin with, um, Hezbollah itself is under economic uh, stress because uh, of a, an economic uh, collapse of uh, Lebanon uh, because uh, the maximum pressure campaign of the US against Iran uh, doesn't allow Iran to provide Hezbollah with the same amount of economic assistance they used to get uh, in the past. Lebanon itself is a, is a failing state with a collapsing economy with a, a, a ratio of debt to GDP, which is over 100, 170%, which is tremendous. Uh, they're unable to pay their debts. 
Uh, they don't have uh, sufficient electricity three, four hours a day. Uh, I've seen reports of some planes uh, flying to uh, Beirut uh, International Airport had to fly back because there, there were no electricity lights uh, in the airport itself. And uh, uh, it really is under tremendous uh, pressure. And uh, many sectors of the Lebanese society blame Hezbollah for uh, Le Lebanon's uh, predicament. Um, because uh, they are blamed of serving Iranian interests rather than Lebanese interests and uh, dragging Lebanon into conflict with uh, Israel uh, because they have an army within a state, uh, an army of their own. And there's a lot of criticism, growing criticism. We've seen demonstrations in Lebanon, including uh, against uh, Hezbollah. And if you uh, you know, coupled with the, the huge impact of uh, COVID-19, this is not the time for Hezbollah to go to war. Uh, they stand much more to lose than, uh, than to gain uh, by doing so. And uh, I think this uh, uh, explains the very restrained manner in, the, in which they have been uh, responding to uh, Israeli activities in in Syria and in Lebanon. But there is a broader context to what we just saw in our northern border, and it has to do with the, the ongoing showdown between Israel and Iran uh, in our neighborhood, especially in uh, Syria in recent years. And uh, this is because Iran, since 2016, has been trying to turn uh, Syria into a very strong uh, military front facing Israel with, uh, <clears throat> with troops, with proxies, with weapons, with the industries, uh, uh, with many, many uh, elements. And Israel, since early 2017, uh, launched a campaign to thwart the Iranian plans uh, with, uh, with uh, relative uh, success. Uh, and that has been going on. Uh, unlike some reports in Israel, the Iranians uh, are not going to leave Syria. They have no intention to, uh, to leave Syria. For them, it's part of what they see as their strategic depth. And for them, it's a front with Israel and they would like to be there. So they just adjusted uh, their activities and their deployment. Uh, but uh, in recent months, we've seen Israel step up its uh, operations against Iranian targets in Syria, believing that there is an opportunity now, given the pressure on Iran, the economic pressure, the killing of Soleimani, COVID, and uh, many, uh, many, many other things that, uh, that pressure uh, the Iranian uh, regime. Israel is concerned specifically uh, first with, as I said, turning uh, Syria into a, a military front with Israel, not only in the border area of Israel in southern Syria, but uh, you know, across uh, the country as part of the so-called uh, land corridor connecting uh, Iran to the Mediterranean through Iraq and Syria. Israel is particularly concerned about the so-called precision project, which is an Iranian project designed to turn a part of Hezbollah's huge arsenal of rockets into highly precise ones uh, with the aim of acquiring a significant arsenal that if they, uh, if they succeed in, uh, might pose a serious military challenge to Israel because Israel is a small country and the, the most critical infrastructure uh, is uh, centered in a re relatively small area. And Israel uh, decided to uh, thwart that uh, project and has taken a lot of uh, action, uh, mostly in Syria, uh, against uh, relevant uh, facilities, uh, activists, uh, and so on. This, uh, of course, um, creates a potential for escalation. But here again, I say that uh, while Iran looks for ways to uh, respond to what Israel is doing in, uh, in Syria, Iran, it's, Iran itself is uh, constrained and restrained because they are under 
extremely heavy pressure. They are one of the most hardest hit countries by COVID-19. And they don't give you the, right, the exact numbers, but it's huge. It's really huge. They're under uh, heavy uh, uh, economic pressure, continuous pressure by the US, uh, which uh, exacts a toll. Uh, they have not been able to fill the void created, created by uh, the elimination of Soleimani. Uh, they are uh, criticized in the region, uh, in, in, including in countries where there are Shiite communities like Iraq and Lebanon for their destabilizing uh, activities. So they, they, they are under very heavy pressure. We've seen one of the you know, potential ways for them to respond uh, recently when the Iranian chief of staff, uh, General Bakari, visited Syria and signed an agreement with the, the Syrian government to provide uh, air defense systems, Iranian air defense systems to Syria so as to uh, respond uh, to Israel. This, by the way, to me signifies also criticism on Russia because the Russians provided Syria with the S-300, but they still, con they still control it. And it's not, it has not been given to, uh, to uh, the Iranians, uh, to, to the Syrian, and they cannot operate it. So, uh, uh, you know, the fact that Iran now suggest its own uh, uh, air defense system tells you something about uh, how uh, these actors uh, regard, uh, regard uh, Russia in this context. All in all, I would say, and I haven't mentioned, of course, the tension uh, over the Iranian nuclear program, that's also uh, out there, and tensions between Iran and the United States in Iraq, with Iran trying to push the U.S. out of the Iraq. There's a lot going that could uh, feed uh, into a uh, potential escalation. Uh, the potential for escalation is there, but uh, to me, the bottom line is that uh, there are very, very strong restraining elements uh, acting today on Iran and on its proxies, on Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, and I think, uh, certainly speaking for, from an Israeli point of view, uh, Israel should continue uh, taking action against Iranian military infrastructure in Syria and if need be elsewhere as well. And I think we have an opportunity to press, uh, not necessarily with the goal of uh, driving them out of Syria, because I don't think this is, uh, for now, a realistic goal, but certainly uh, curbing their activities, limiting them, and denying them the ability to realize the so-called uh, precision project, which I think is critical uh, for Israel. So let me stop here and give room to Seth. Right, right. That was very comprehensive um, and, of course, extremely accurate. Um, Seth, any, any details that you could fill in about what's going on right now, today? Well, I think what I would add a bit is that we are living in a very interesting time at the moment, and there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, and questions here about exactly what took place in the last few days and trying to, I think, get a sense at the moment as to where or not this escalation is actually going to go. I feel like we're a bit in kind of um, a very strange and potentially kind of deadly, uh, deadly dance right now between Israel, Israel and Hezbollah on one hand. But I think we need to remember also, as, as he mentioned, the kind of larger picture, which is the United States around tensions as well, and then Israel around tensions. So it's kind of like a multi-layered cake. And therefore, for instance, I think everyone who has been paying attention to Iran today and yesterday, they've been having these huge exercises uh, in the Persian Gulf, off of the Straits of Hormuz, in which they fired a whole bunch of uh, ballistic missiles and rockets, and they used different drones. And they also towed, towed out to see this this giant fake American uh, model aircraft carrier and then drove their fast boats around it in circles. So it, it turns out that during those drills, 
um, the ballistic missile launches at least, caused an alert at several U.S. bases there uh, in Qatar and the UAE. So, you know, this is a very serious, serious, t tense time, I think. And if we look back just over the last year in terms of U.S.-Iran problems, there's been dozens of rocket attacks almost every day now on U.S. forces in Iraq. Uh, only around four people have been killed in those attacks, but the United States has responded. And that means I think we have a whole series of kind of interlinked conflicts in the region in which you have a series of different, let's say, strings that are all attached. But if you pull on one, you, you get to all the rest. It's like one of those kind of um, exercises where you make a bit of a web, you know. So I think when we look at the, the Israel has bullet tensions, it's part of this, this very complicated and, as I said, kind of deadly dance in which I think both Israel and Hezbollah understand each other quite well. Hezbollah has uh, X number of rockets, whether it's 150,000, 100,000. It's trying to improve its abilities, and that includes whether it's trying to improve the drones it has or the precision-guided munitions. And, of course, we've seen those same munitions and weapons that Iran has trafficked, not just to Hezbollah, but also to the Houthis in Yemen, and which is another one of these kind of strange strings that attaches to Saudi Arabia. So, for instance, the Houthis have been using combinations of drones and cruise missiles uh, and other ordnance to attack, uh, or ballistic missiles, I should say, to attack Saudi Arabia. And last September, Iran used a combination of uh, drones and cruise missiles to attack a Saudi oil facility. Now you could say that that's a kind of dry run for what the Iranians would like Hezbollah to do against Israel. But the other side of the coin, I think, is that everyone understands that the equation today between Israel and Hezbollah is very different than the equation uh, in last, say, decades, because the American administration is, is withdrawing from the region bit by bit, and the American administration also, if you read at least officially what they say, they totally support Israel. And they basically say, listen, these faraway conflicts, as Donald Trump said to West Point graduates, it's not our problem. But the message there is, listen, you can do whatever you want. In the old days, if we recall 2006 conflict or other conflicts, there was always this kind of timetable as to how much time does Israel have to fight against Hezbollah? What can Israel do? And the reality is that, of course, there might be other countries. There, of course, are other countries involved in the UN Security Council and in the world that can pressure Israel. But the fact that America, Israel is not going to have any pressure from Washington to end any sort of conflict, I think, changes a lot of the equations and the calculations that Hezbollah has to make. Also, Israel is, is undergoing a rapid or a, an attempted revolution in terms of its IDF, um, this kind of momentum plan of rolling out new units, uh, some of which have different nice names like a multi-dimensional unit or a, there's a new um, seventh wing in the Air Force that combines a whole series of special units. Uh, but Israel is certainly a totally different army that the Hezbollah will face today than in 2006. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that Hezbollah is not also a totally different force. It has all this experience fighting in Syria. Uh, probably some of that experience is good for them, but how much of that experience has retarded their abilities? Because Hezbollah's fighters in Syria have faced off against whom? The Syrian rebels? So not exactly Israel. And uh, it's fine that the Hezbollah has operatives now. They're trying to dig into the burrow into all these communities next to the Golan. And we saw that last year with this so-called killer drone team in which Hezbollah sought to attempt to launch a drone into Israel and then those guys were killed. And there have been other incidences in which Hezbollah members have turned, uh, turned up dead or been killed not so far from the Golan. Of course, Hezbollah has sometimes tried to blame Israel or in other cases not blamed Israel. Either way, um, I think as he indicated, Hezbollah has painted itself a bit into the corner by saying that it wants to respond. So once you telegraph to your enemy or your opponent, well, if you do X, then we have to do Y. Um, which Israel also, I think, telegraphs a bit sometimes to its opponents, you know, which is like, I mean, you hear sometimes the statements from Israel as well, you know, 
we, you know, don't test us or what have you. And you also have this strange dance with Hamas as well about like Hamas every once in a while has some crazy statements about, well, if you do this, you will open the gates of hell and we'll have to do all this. It's fine. But the reality is Hezbollah, I think, is a very serious organization. So when it says it's going to, to retaliate, the expectation is it will retaliate. And we've seen that since the beginning of the Syrian war. They have tried to create a kind of deterrence, a kind of um, not mutually assured destruction, but a mutually understandable concept, which is that if you kill one of us, then we will fire an anti-tank missile. And there is always a question of, well, where does that, what does that equation mean? Because if, for instance, I think after Jihad Magnia was killed, they tried to, they tried to kill, they did kill several Israeli soldiers. And last year, there was this very strange incident in which they fired the missile. Israel evacuated its wounded, which turned out to be mannequins. And then we had this very strange incident two days ago uh, next to Hardov. It's interesting that Hezbollah, or at least in Israel's narrative and, and the strange dual narratives, which is that Israel's narrative is that it, Israel thwarted an attack or some sort of penetration, infiltration raid. Hezbollah's narrative is, well, nothing happened. The Israelis are just crazy. They totally over, the Israelis just, you know, shot their guns for no reason. And, uh, and now you see we as Hezbollah have a right to retaliate more, which is fine. But the reality of what happened in Hardov is interesting because Nasrallah has given the statements before in which he said, you know, if one of our members is killed over here in the Golan, we have a right to respond kind of wherever we want. We don't have to respond in Hardov, which is the area of Mezrat Sheba, Sheba Farms, that Israel expects us to respond, which is part of, I think, as I said, this kind of very strange chess game, the dangerous, deadly dance. Which, in which the rules are sort of known. And Hezbollah is saying, well, no, no, the rules are not that. We're going to expand the, the conflict zone to the Golan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this, this idea of, I think, kind of exp, you know, expanding the rules of the game is interesting because I don't know, some people rem remember one of the critiques of the Vietnam conflict was this idea that, well, the whole conflict will take place in South Vietnam, but the United States will not bomb the North. And then there was the whole thing with the Nixon administration, well, no, we will bomb the North. So this idea of creating these kind of paradigms and rules, and I think also the question of creating a sort of concept under which you view the conflict, which is, well, these are the rules, so therefore it won't go outside the circle, which is, I think, something some people have read about the 73 war recall that, that Israel was criticized for getting into a kind of concept that then led, led Israel perhaps into complacency. Whether or, not, whether or not that's happening at the moment, I think is not entirely clear because it's not always clear, I think, how much... Hezbollah fears Israel or how much Hezbollah, if you read, believe its propaganda, which is that, no, you see, we've humiliated Israel. We've forced Israel to be on alert. Now we can just do whatever we want. That's, that's fine. They have their, their narrative. Iran has its own kind of narrative, which is, I think, interesting. The Iranian media is not trying to pump up this concept of Hezbollah's retaliation. The Iranian media is concentrating on this exercise at the moment. Um, which is interesting because the pro, other pro Hezbollah media outlets like Al Mayadeen are focusing obsessively on how brilliant and genius Hezbollah has been in the last few days to somehow uh, force Israel to go on alert and force Israel, therefore, to make mistakes, in their view, make mistakes. Uh, but I think, that, I think that's the, the real question, I guess, is when which, which side will miscalculate and make a mistake that or or in not in its not in its own view a mistake but for the enemy's view in which there will therefore become a kind of escalation or cycle of violence now on the one hand it could be that israel and hezbollah are settling into a kind of uh this kind of dangerous dance but it's similar to what's happening with hamas which is that if anyone recalls we have not had a conflict with hamas since 2014. i remember we used to have conflicts with hamas every year or two so it was, it's interesting the degree to which Israel has been able to forestall that and whether or not that's some sort of diplomacy or messaging or whether or not it's Hamas's own uh, weakness because it's, it has been checked through all the means that Israel has, that's fine. But I think that the question is whether, you know, it has well as a much more dangerous, serious organization, also because of Iran's backing. So the degree to which you know, when does Iran want to operationalize Hezbollah? When does Iran want to try to uh, finally, you know, I think land the first blow or land the second punch or what have you, which is that Iran keeps saying it wants to do X or Y, whether it wants to retaliate against the Americans or retaliate against Israel. 
I think that's, you know, but that's a very dangerous, that's a very dangerous language because at some point someone has to do something. Israel has certainly gotten away with, I think, carrying out openly more than 1,000 airstrikes. And I mean, I can wrap up here, but I think that when you look at all the details and you look just going back several years, when you add it all up and you say to yourself, well, okay, at some point something has to change. And who pulls that first trigger? Who decides that the timetable is not in their favor? For instance, the Trump administration may leave office in six months, maybe not. Someone, someone cares a lot about that timetable. That may be Iran, that may be maybe, maybe also Jerusalem or Hezbollah. Everyone, I think, is looking at those different things and trying to calculate, okay, wait a sec. Well, wait a sec, what should we do now? You know, should we go all out or should we keep managing this conflict keep up these uh, pinpoint airstrikes, precision attacks, which actually, to be honest, basically don't kill anyone, which is kind of extraordinary because it's not normal that you can carry out a thousand airstrikes and kill such few number of people. But Israel has reached a kind of peak um, in terms of its abilities, or not, not, maybe not a peak, but it's, it's reached an extreme ability to do precision airstrikes with very low casualties, which was something that I think we didn't see 20 years ago. So. And that will, of course, also determine how this conflict, if and when it takes place, is actually, I think, take, happens. So that, I guess I'll leave it there and we can answer any questions. Excellent, excellent. Um, so it, it seems very much that the, at least upwards of 130,000 missiles has led Israel and Hezbollah and Lebanon um, to have this cat and mouse game, you know, where they, they really do not want casualties and they don't want any further exploits. Um, escalation. Yeah, um, even Deputy um, Hezbollah Commander Naim Kassam just said that um, this does not, this atmosphere does not um, indicate war. So I think they're, they're very, very much afraid. Um, but their whole modus vivendi is the elimination of the state of Israel. And that's what they live for. Um, so we know that it's very, very explosive. My questions to both of you are, um, Ahmed has spent a great deal of time and energy investigating the aid that we give to um, the Lebanese Armed Forces, which to an end, um, it's 221 to $224 million a year, which we've been doing since um, uh, shortly after the 2006 um, or with Lebanon for the LAF to act as leverage against Hezbollah. Um, um, so my first question is, um, has this worked? You know, what is the relationship between the LAF and Hezbollah today? And my second question is UNIFIL. Um, is UNIFIL doing its job in Southern Lebanon? I noticed they just evacuated. It seems like when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, is UNIFIL serving its function in southern Lebanon? So if both of you would like to talk a little bit about that. Okay, let me start. Uh, first, before I answer your question about uh, the U.S. assistance to the LAF, I would like to sp speak uh, more generally about uh, U.S. and international assistance to Lebanon, to the Lebanese state. And uh, since Lebanon today is uh, <clears throat> in dire need of uh, international economic assistance, um, they have approached the IMF uh, two years ago, uh, donors conference in, in France pledged $11 billion, which were uh, never provided. Uh, I think uh, this provides the international community with some leverage over Lebanon, given the really terrible situation there. Uh, and um, I've seen all sorts of uh, people uh, deal with it in different ways. Some say you should pressure Lebanon to uh, uh, <clears throat> disarm Hezbollah, which I don't think is a realistic goal. I don't think it's going to work. But uh, I would put some international pressure on the Lebanese government, uh, of which Hezbollah is the most is the stronger the stronger partner, of course, the so strong, stronger part, uh, to um, apply pressure on Hezbollah in terms of, of its uh, precision project in Lebanon, in Lebanese territory, and in terms of uh, 
its assistance to uh, the Syrian regime, which is under American uh, sanctions uh, today and very heavy uh, pressure. I think uh, the situation is so dire in Lebanon that uh, the international uh, community should condition some of his, its assistance to Lebanon. Not, I wouldn't say any type of assistance. There are basic humanitarian needs that you have to provide anyway, and you're not going to punish uh, Lebanese citizens. But in terms of dealing with the government, I think there should be some uh, strings uh, attached. As far as the LF, uh, LAF is concerned, it's a, it's a mixed picture. I, I think that uh, when you discuss this uh, issue with uh, policy makers and decision makers in the United States or in Europe, you often hear the argument that the LAF is distinct from Hezbollah, it's a national, uh, <clears throat> it's a national agency and you should keep it as such and you should balance the picture in Lebanon so that you have an independent army vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. Reality is more complex than that because in reality you have uh, Hezbollah infiltrating parts of the Lebanese army we have seen close cooperation between Hezbollah and the Lebanese army in fighting ISIS. They started, they launched a campaign the same day uh, in the same territorial area in Al Sal in northern Lebanon and, in, and from Syria and Lebanon simultaneously. There's a lot of cooperation. We've seen uh, more than one case of cooperation along our border, including officers in the Lebanese army who were identified by us as uh, cooperating with Hezbollah. Uh, we've seen a parade in the area of Qusair where the uh, Hezbollah uh, showcased uh, a, uh, <clears throat> a, a military vehicle which belonged to the Lebanese army and was provided by, uh, by uh, the US. So it's much more of a mixed bag here and I would say that I would not go as far as to cut all funding or assistance to the Lebanese army, but I would be much more careful about it, uh, monitor it more carefully, and uh, be very careful about deciding what to provide them and what not to provide them. Because you don't want certain, uh, certain capabilities falling to the hands of uh, Hezbollah or later being used against uh, Israel or against anybody else. As far as UNIFIL is concerned, it is obvious, uh, I think it's, uh, it's not disputed, that UNIFIL cannot implement its mandate. Uh, it is being prevented from uh, implementing its mandate by the Lebanese army, by Hezbollah. They control the south. The UNIFIL cannot go freely into Lebanese villages, into uh, private property, uh, even if they have uh, concrete evidence, intelligence evidence that there are weapons there. Suppose we provide them with uh, evidence that uh, there are rockets in a certain uh, house in a village, they cannot go there. They will be prevented by the Lebanese army and by Hezbollah. And when Israel discovered cross-border tunnels going from Lebanon into Israeli territory, and uh, we asked UNIFIL to go see them on the Lebanese side of the border, and they were there physically, UNIFIL was prevented by the Lebanese army from going there. Uh, what more do you want? So obviously they're, they're, they're not fulfilling their mandate and uh, to the point that some uh, of my uh, colleagues in the defense establishment in Israel are saying, you know, if, they are, if this goes on and they do not fulfill the mandate, maybe we are better off without them. And it was uh, a, an assumption in our defense establishment and government for many, many years, since UNIFIL was established in 1978, that we are better off with them than without them. They fill a certain void, and as long as both parties uh, won't come, uh, UNIFIL is there to help them with that. But uh, if UNIFIL cannot implement its uh, mandate and will only uh, you know, limit our uh, ability to take action in time of need, then maybe we're better off without them. That you hear more of such voices. It's not, it's not gotten to the point where Israel is officially saying, kick them out. But uh, that's the thinking I hear from uh, many people in our defense establishment today. 
<clears throat> Seth? I'm here, yes. Hi. Yes. Do you have feelings about the, um, the relationship between the LAF and Hezbollah and um, whether or not UNIFIL is fulfilling its mandate? I mean, it's t two different creatures, I guess. I think that, I, I think UNIFIL tries to fulfill, you know, parts of its mandate. It tries to investigate things. Uh, it does try to give answers. It tries mm -hmm. to document. I mean, it kind of has a very difficult and unfair mandate because you have Hezbollah, which is a, which is a state within a state terrorist organization. Um, even if you don't, even if some people don't want to call it terrorist organizations, it's not normal that a country, any country in the world, in fact, has not only a normal standing army, but then some other group that has almost as many weapons as the standing army, but is not actually an official part of the army, but is, but just kind of exists. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any other example like that except for failed states where you have armed militias and things like that. Even in Iraq, for instance, all of these different militias are actually officially <laughs> part of the state, uh, which is very different than Hezbollah. So I don't know. I think UNIFIL is, is between a rock and a hard place. It's one of these strange creations of the UN, a product of the of the 20th century, which um, you know lives in this this world in which there's a rules based world, which actually, for some reason, oddly enough, exists next to a creature that doesn't obey the rules. So, and I think it's a very difficult in any in any in any sense of order when you have a, a ostensibly a mandate that is somehow contradiction to the very nature of what's around it so the unifil i think the unifil the pre people that are involved in it are, are very good people and try their best within the limitations they have in terms of the lebanese armed forces um it's another bit strange question i mean the lebanese armed forces it's not entirely clear what the lebanese armed forces do because when hezbollah for instance decided to intervene in the Syrian civil war in 2011, 2012, it sent thousands of its soldiers to fight in Syria. Well, usually when you have a state and a government and they decide to, to be involved in a neighboring conflict, um, the government and the armed forces would do that, but they didn't. So Hezbollah also claims to be quote unquote, the resistance and the, um, defending Lebanon from Israel, right? Well, that would usually be what the armed forces would do. So what, ex what exactly does the Lebanese army do? Uh, I know that in terms of what the, the theory is, which is that it needs to be supported by the United States and others in order to somehow um, counterbalance Hezbollah, but there's no evidence that that has ever happened. The Lebanese armed forces, no matter how much money you were to give them, even if you gave them trillions of dollars, would never counterbalance Hezbollah because their raison d'etre is not to confront Hezbollah the raison d'etre is just to create a kind of bubble in which Hezbollah can breed and grow and, and, and get as powerful as it wants. So this whole nature of Lebanon is, is a bit strange, which is not entirely Lebanon's fault, of course. Lebanon was occupied by the Syrians, then the Palestinians, there was the Israelis. It's not entirely Lebanon's fault that it has a very strange structure like this, i.e. it's not a failed state like Somalia, and yet it's a functioning state with, a, with an army that doesn't really entirely seem to do what normal armies do. So I know, for instance, if you follow ISIS's attacks on, um, on Lebanon, right? ISIS did, did attacks on Lebanon and there was an ISIS uh, group or cell there that was operating in the mountains between uh, Lebanon and Syria. And if you recall, I think when the final ISIS guys decided to kind of surrender and be transported to Syria, I think it was Hezbollah that brokered the deal, not really the Lebanese armed forces, which once again leads you to say, well, I don't understand. And what are the, what do the, what does the LAF do except for sponge up dollars, Western dollars, uh, and ostensibly serve as a kind of fig leaf to the idea that Hezbollah is being confronted, but there's absolutely no evidence in the last decades that it ever was confronted. Now, if you were to starve the LAF of money and just destroy this, just say, well, no more, obviously, evil and, and bad actors, I suppose, would step into the breach, right? Russia, China, I don't know, Iran, someone. So that's, you're in, it's a kind of, what's the word, you know, uh, catch 22? You don't, no matter what you do with the LAF, you will never win, I don't think. With UNIFIL, of course, you could just abolish it. I don't know if that would necessarily r reduce tensions. I think UNIFIL does play an important role, and I think that it, it facilitates certain things that are able to go on in which Israelis, of course, will not, would never meet officially with Hezbollah or whatever, but UNIFIL is there somehow. I think 
So it plays some sort of role, I think. And uh, right. it, it, it's not clear to me how you get out of this situation it, it, that you're in with this catch 22 of Lebanon, because, because there's no, it's, it, this, all this stuff would have had to be ripped out by the roots. You would have had to go back to the beginning, like go back in time and never have this happen. But the, it's very hard now to, to get out of that. Excellent, excellent. No easy answers. So in the remaining minutes, um, um, Sarah Lee at Thompson, our wonderful Director of Communications, will read some of the many questions that come in and we apologize if we don't have time to answer all of the questions. Sarah Lea? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we have had a number of questions come in and as Sarah said, we won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll get through as many as we can. So the first question we have, uh, Israel seems to be taking full advantage of Iran's economic instability to degrade its nuclear capabilities in Iran and its military activities in Syria. So why not take similar advantage of Hezbollah's weakened state to stem the tide on its development of PGMs? Whoever mm -hmm. feels comfortable answering first. Well, uh, I wonder what that exactly means. If uh, the, uh, the intention behind the question is that Israel should initiate uh, uh, military strikes against Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. <clears throat> I think the, the meaning of this is that uh, uh, we will slide into war with Hezbollah. And I think we both spoke about the fact that uh, neither Israel nor Hezbollah desire escalation to war, uh, certainly not now. But I think there's plenty of historical uh, examples of uh, two conflicting parties uh, sliding to war against their initial will uh, because of miscalculation or for other uh, reasons. But in this case, I think uh, it's quite predictable that if we strike uh, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon itself, uh, then uh, they will necessarily respond and uh, the likelihood of escalation if we do that in Lebanon, unlike Syria, is, is much, much uh, higher. It doesn't mean that uh, Israel's hands are completely tied and we cannot do anything in Lebanon. There are many ways of uh, taking action, uh, but not all of them are, uh, are overt, not all of them are kinetic. There are many ways that we can uh, apply pressure on Hezbollah, and we should, and I'm very much in favor of applying uh, pressure on uh, Hezbollah, but uh, I, I, I think uh, that we both sides realize that we don't want to press the wrong button at the wrong time and uh, find ourselves uh, at war. So we have to be uh, very uh, careful and uh, continue uh, putting pressure on them the way we do now. I mean, we do put pressure on Hezbollah uh, in many, many ways. I think they are restrained. I think they are uh, definitely under uh, extreme uh, pressure, under stress. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good time to, to apply uh, additional types of pressure, including, by the way, uh, as I said, international pressure, political, economic, and other types. It's not only kinetic, kinetic over pressure. <laughs> Seth, do you have anything to add to that? I forgot the question. It was about a preemptive strike. Um, you know, look, I, w I think we could see the time, depending on the calculation in which Israel decides that there is an existential, existential threat in Lebanon somewhere, which has to be neutralized. And, um, and I, I think we've seen, for instance, some satellite imagery that has, or some other details every once in a while that are leaked purposely to uh, foreign press in the region which seems to put some pressure on, well, is Hezbollah bringing weapons here? Or they're stockpiling them here? Or there's a certain number of bases there? I think a lot of that is messaging, but I think the point eventually is, yeah, listen, there is a point at which it's too much for Israel and, and that, that of course, Israel will have to weigh that. If I may just add, uh, I think what I said doesn't mean that uh, Israel will not take action if uh, Hezbollah crosses what Israel perceives as a red line. Uh, in such a case, the very definition of a red line meaning me, means the willingness to risk war, and Israel will do it. But uh, before we reach that point, uh, we don't uh, feel uh, you know we have to take that kind of action. And let me just give you one 
Uh, one example following on what just uh, said that uh, just said, when uh, Israel um, uh, acquired intelligence that Hezbollah was establishing a a facility to manufacture precise rockets in eastern Lebanon. Uh, and the question was about PGMs, okay? Before uh, taking any military action, I Israel publicized the fact and with photos. And what happened next is Hezbollah uh, closed the facility and moved elsewhere. <laughs> Okay, one more question, Sir Leah? Sure. Um, the next question we have, should Israel make clear to Iran that in the event of an Iranian puppet, i.e. Hezbollah, launching a significant attack on Israel, that Israel will not only respond to the puppet, but also directly to the puppet master, in your opinion? Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, all I can say is that uh, the thinking by uh, strategic planners in Israel is... Uh, you hear more and more voices uh, speaking in these terms, no? namely that uh, uh, Iran should not enjoy immunity if it uses proxies to, to hit hard uh, inside Israeli territory. They should not be immune in their own territory. And if I may add my opinion, uh, the biggest vulnerabilities for Iran are not in Syria and Lebanon, they are in Iran itself. Seth, do you have anything to add? No, no, I think that's, yeah, I agree, exactly. Right, right. Okay, Sarlea, another question? Um, so, um, Brigadier General Herzog might have touched on this already, but in terms of Israel reacting to Hezbollah, what would the red line be that they'd have to cross in order for Israel to, to start a war, or would they try to avoid that at all costs? Uh, I don't think anybody wants to uh, publicly uh, draw uh, the exact line. It's better that they will uh, guess what that line is rather than me telling them. Because uh, even though I'm not an official, uh, but uh, if you state the red line, implicitly it means that they can take action up until that, that line. And you don't want to do that. Uh, with some exceptions, I must say, when our Prime Minister stood in the UN and drew a red line in terms of Iranian enrichment to 20%, and he was criticized by uh, quite a few, but ultimately they respected it. Excellent. <clears throat> Sir Leah, uh, and Seth, did you want to add anything at all to that? Um. No, I, I think I don't think I think you yes, covered it. Right. covered it very well. Right, right. Okay, Sarlea. So for the next question, do you think Israel could take out most of Hezbollah's missiles quickly to protect its citizens, uh, its cities from major destruction, or is there a disaster no matter what uh, to civilian Israel? I would not use the term uh, disaster. Uh, let Let's not uh, exaggerate. It is going to be uh, tough on Israel, definitely, because given the arsenal of rockets uh, we just discussed and their ability to reach everywhere in Israel, I think uh, it's going to be a different ball game than what we've experienced. Uh, and it takes time to deal with, uh, with such a uh, challenge. What I would say is that, uh, as uh, Seth mentioned the IDF is in a very different place today than it used to be in 2006. There was and there is an ongoing revolution in terms of uh, the connectivity between various uh, arms uh, agencies, uh, units, and so on, uh, and and the creation of a cycle between uh, intelligence and targeting. Uh, we are at a very different place now. And uh, definitely we will pay a price, but I think Hezbollah will pay a much, much uh, bigger price. And I'm not saying it by way of uh, bragging. I, I do believe these are the realities. Excellent, excellent. And, and don't, let's not forget that uh, Israel is building an, uh, an active defense uh, against missiles and rockets. We already have the layer of uh, Iron Dome 
against uh, shorter range uh, rockets. Uh, we have uh, initial uh, capacity of the next layer, which is David Sling, and uh, this has been in development, and uh, I think uh, ultimately we'll be able to deal with the whole range of rockets they have. Excellent. Great. I think we have time for another question. Uh, and just a notice to everyone who's tuning in, this webinar was recorded and will be available on Emmett's website by tomorrow if for uh, sharing or rewatching. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have, do you believe that uh, cyber warfare can be used to help weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon? Do you want to start, Seth? Yeah, I mean, look, I think cyber warfare is, the, is certainly the next, uh, look, it's the next, it's the next thing. I guess the question for a, uh, an organization like Hezbollah is Hezbollah doesn't necessarily have the level of infrastructure that, for instance, a country like Iran might have where cyber warfare, at least what we've heard in reports, uh, can target things like, uh, you know, centrifuges or desalination plants or port systems. So the question is, what kind of system does Hezbollah actually use? Does it does it have all sorts of, um, you know, sorts of bunkers and systems, electronics and computers, so that it's not entirely clear what the cyber warfare would necessarily be used for in Lebanon. Maybe, maybe other things that are peripheral around Hezbollah. Hezbollah has a very good communications network. So that, I think, is something that, for instance, when they killed Rafi Kariri, or at least they're accused of it, it was a communications network that was used to track them down a bit. So maybe you can go after things like that. I assume, of course, that that is the kind of thing that a, a country like Israel, which is net centric and high tech, of course, has already thought about. So um, that's important. And by the way, just to go back to the last question about, you know, what we expect in terms of the home front, I think that is one of the issues here is I think everyone understands that, you know, this is not going to be like with uh, Hamas. Israel has gotten a bit used to the last decade, uh, the ability to have uh, these kind of wonder weapons like the Zion Dome to protect everyone. And it's such a radically different kind of war than we were facing back in 2009 with the Sons and Sterot. And the fact that everyone can sit in the cafe and listen to sirens go off and sip coffee and watch the interceptions, which to be honest is, is actually the degree to which some of us have gotten to, I think that kind of um, idea that it's a walk in the park, everyone understands with Hezbollah it's not going to be like that. And it's important for Israel's home front command to pound that into people's heads, which is no, no, no. When there are going to be sirens, you have to go inside because there is a, there is a very uh, huge number of rockets. And the question as to the ability to stop all of them and how precisely uh, Israel will be able to conduct itself in the opening days of the conflict will be very, very difficult. So I think that that is all part of what I think I said before, which is this kind of very dangerous dance in which both sides understand each other's capabilities. Uh, and, that, and, that's, and that's kind of the... It's like two boxers going to a match in which you've watched all the other fight reels of the boxer. You know exactly who you're going to face. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone has to win. So I think that that's the complexity, at least in terms of those first days of the war, which will be, I think, uh, absolute uh, difficult uh, terror on both sides. All right. Um, on that very, very cheery note, um, I want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panelists um, I, this is uh, our time of foreboding in the Jewish calendar, and we certainly um, have increased our sense of fear and trembling and foreboding, um, despite um, Israel's phenomenal prowess, especially in, you know, the, the ability of um, cyber warfare and high tech. Um, this is, it's the situation does remain um, extremely tense right now, and um, for all of you who are listening, who um, do um, observe the fast that's coming up tonight, I um, want to wish you a very meaningful and an easy fast. And I, I want to thank um, Michael and Seth um, tremendously and profoundly for, for um, your profundity of knowledge and wisdom about this and so many other subjects. Thank you so much. And my board has reminded me to say that all of this costs us money. And um, if people can go to our website at www.ametonline.org and support um, our organization. This is uh, the 24th or the 25th webinar that we've held since the beginning of this pandemic. And um, um, we do this all as a service um, to the public at large. And um, 
hope because we do believe that um, a well-informed um, public helps create the perceptions that create good policy. And again, thank you so much, Seth and Michael, and I want to wish you all an easy and a meaningful fest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.